I would remind you that when we broke off uh, three weeks ago, we were still considering verses 16 and 17 in the first chapter of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. These two great verses in which we read, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to every one that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, we have indicated that in these two verses, the apostle lays down the great theme, the great subject of the whole epistle. The epistle is primarily an exposition of these two verses. In verse 16, he states his theme in general. In verse 17, he particularizes. Now, we have seen that you can look at it like that, or if you prefer it, you can look at it in this way. That in these two verses, the apostle is giving us his reasons for not being ashamed of the gospel. And we've already dealt uh, with a number of them. He tells us that he's not ashamed to go to Rome and to preach because he's got a gospel. That was his first reason. It is good news. In the second place, he's not ashamed because it deals with salvation. And we've considered what that means. Then thirdly, he's not ashamed because it's God's message. And that in and of itself is sufficient. But fourthly, he is not ashamed of it because it is a powerful message, an efficacious, an effective message, an effectual message. It isn't merely a statement. It, it does something. It works. And we saw how he works that out in terms of the word itself. It is by the word that we are born again. It is by this very message that God accomplishes his work of salvation. And then the fifth reason uh, which we found he has for not being ashamed of the gospel is that it's a gospel for all, for everybody, uh, for the Jew first and also to the Greek, for the Greek, chronologically first for the Jew and perhaps especially to remind the Jew that he needs it as much as the, the Greek. But the glorious thing about it is that it is for everybody, that uh, no one because of sin is outside the scope and the ambit. Because it is God's power, it holds out a hope for all. Well, now then, having given those five reasons, we can go on to consider his sixth reason. And uh, this uh, sixth reason is found in the 17th verse. And that is that it is in this way that God's uh, Power unto salvation is revealed. For, he says, you notice the repetition of this for, for therein, that's to say in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So here I say is his sixth reason. It reveals how the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The Christian church is as she is today because men have forgotten revelation and have been putting philosophy in its place. Now that's the exact opposite of the gospel. The gospel isn't something that invites us into a great search or a great quest. It is an announcement. It's a revelation. It's an unfolding, an unveiling of something, which you see is the very exact opposite of what has been so popular for at least the last hundred years. Well, very well, what does it mean? Well, it means making manifest. It means making plain or making clear. That's the meaning of revelation. We mustn't interpret that as meaning that this was not at all known in the past. Some people have tended to say that. That nothing at all was known about the gospel until the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ and until the New Testament. They have wrongly said that there is no revelation 
of the gospel in the Old Testament. But that, of course, is wrong, and we can prove it's wrong in this way. We've already done so, in a sense, in considering the second verse of this first chapter of this epistle, where Paul puts it like this. Paul, the servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, then, in brackets, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, or in his Holy Scriptures, so that we must never say that it is here revealed for the first time. It doesn't mean that. But we've got also further evidence to substantiate uh, this statement. In the third chapter, the apostle again, uh, well, indeed, before we come to that, at the end of this very verse that we are considering, he reminds us of this. You notice how he puts it. Uh, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written. And then he quotes uh, from the second chapter of Habakkuk, And the fourth verse, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So it's not something absolutely new, which was entirely unheard of before. And then in the third chapter, in the 21st verse, he puts it again quite plainly. But now, he says, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. It had been witnessed to by the law and the prophets, but there is a sense in which it is now being made manifest. And then, of course, when we arrive at chapter 4, you will find that the apostle devotes most of that chapter to saying that this, of course, was known in the days of Abraham, that this was God's method of justifying Abraham. So it goes back at any rate as far as that. And we remember our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's statement when he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. He didn't see it clearly, but he saw it, and he rejoiced in it. So we must not say that this is something which is absolutely new and which was entirely unknown before. Now, the apostle is so concerned about this that he says it again in the very last chapter in verses 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but is now made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. There it is once more. And, of course, there's another illustration of the same thing in the third chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians in verses 3 to 6. Well, what does it mean then? Well, you can put it like this. It was known in that way, but it wasn't clear. It's manifest now. It was then, if you like, as in a glass darkly. The Apostle Peter, you remember, tells us in his first epistle, in his first chapter, uh, verses 10, 11, and 12, that the prophets looked into these things. They didn't fully understand when they foretold the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. They realized that it was not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things. They saw it dimly, vaguely. Yes, they did see it, but not clearly. But now, says Paul, it has been revealed. It has been made manifest. It's open. It's an open secret. It's no longer a mystery. The mystery has been revealed. It's an open secret. It is plain and it is clear. And that is something, of course, in which the apostle rejoiced and in which all Christian people should rejoice with him. There's just one other thing about this word revealed which seems to me to be important and to need emphasis. It doesn't merely mean that something is put before us for us to look at. It does mean that. But it means more than that. The apostle here in these two verses is not just saying that God has put before mankind for its consideration his way of salvation. What he's really saying, as we've already seen in considering the word power, 
is that this is now in operation. It's being put into practice. It's already being made effectual. It's already in execution. And it is plain and clear and manifest in that sense. Very well, then, the apostle, the apostle greatly rejoices as he thinks of this. And it is our privileged position as Christian people. We look back across the old dispensation, the Old Testament, and we see people looking forward to something glorious that was going to happen. We can look back and say, it has happened. It has taken place. It's the same thing. They were looking forward. We look backwards. But it's the same great truth, the same mighty revelation. Very well, there's your sixth reason. Let us move on to the seventh reason. The seventh reason he has for not being ashamed of the gospel is the content of the revelation. And what is the content of this revelation? Well, it's this. It is the righteousness of God. For therein, he says, is the righteousness of God revealed. Now, this, of course, is in many ways the key expression of the whole epistle. Certainly the key expression of these two verses. And uh, indeed, it is, as I say, the key to the understanding of the apostle's whole argument running right through the epistle and his argument in his other epistles. It is, in a sense, a key to the Christian faith and the Christian message. And we can't uh, deal with this without reminding ourselves that it was when he came to understand this that Martin Luther truly became a Christian. It was the understanding of this verse that really produced the Protestant Reformation. So there is a sense in which we can say that if we as Protestants don't understand this 17th verse of this first chapter truly, well, we are unworthy of the name of Protestant. And indeed, it is even doubtful whether we are Christian at all. There is no more vital verse in the whole of Scripture than this 17th verse. What does it mean? What does he mean by this righteousness of God? Therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Well, we've got to start with a negative. It doesn't mean righteousness as an attribute of God's person or of God's character. Sometimes the expression, the righteousness of God, is used in that way. When you consider the attributes of God, you've got to include this attribute of righteousness. God is eternally just and righteous. Everything that God does is righteous. So, God, one of the attributes of the character of God is his everlasting and eternal righteousness. But I am suggesting, indeed I am asserting very strongly, that the apostle does not mean that at this point, and for this good reason. That if the gospel of Jesus Christ were merely a, a revelation of the holiness and the justice and the righteousness of God, and no more, far from being good news, far from being a gospel, it would be the most terrifying and the most alarming thing that we could ever discover. Now, here it's just at this point that the experience of Luther is of such great value to us. Because Luther, while he was yet a Roman Catholic, decided to give a series of lectures on the epistle to the Romans. And he came up against this verse. And because of his misinterpretation of the meaning of the righteousness of God, he passed through a great agony of soul. Listen to his own words. He said, I labored diligently and anxiously as to how to understand Paul's word in Romans 1.17 where he says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel. I sought long and knocked anxiously for the expression, the righteousness of God blocked the way. You see, he thought it was just a description of God's character and God's being. And as he stood before this revelation, 
of God as light in whom is no darkness at all, a God who is so just that he cannot even look upon sin, as he saw this righteousness of God, well, he just felt it was impossible. He says this expression blocked the way to salvation for him. And he went further. He said, as often as I read that declaration, I wished always that God had not made the gospel known. You see, he thought that it meant this. That in the Old Testament there was a revelation of the righteousness of God. You've got it in the Ten Commandments and the Moral Law and in the writings and the teaching of the Pharisees. Yes, but really that was an imperfect revelation of it. It's only in Christ you get a full revelation. And it's infinitely greater. The Old Testament says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This says love your enemies and so on. This tremendous exposition of it in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I saw it and I wished always that God had not made the gospel known. Because this fuller revelation of the righteousness of God seemed to make me utterly hopeless and helpless. And I didn't know what to do with myself. The righteousness of God blocked the way. Now then, you see how important it is that we should understand clearly what the Apostle does mean by this expression. What does it mean then? Well, here it means a righteousness that comes from God and a righteousness that satisfies God. Very well, let's approach it like this. What is righteousness? Righteousness of necessity in view of what I've been saying about righteousness as an attribute in the character of God. Righteousness means a conformity to God, a conformity to God's law, a conformity to God's demands. Righteousness is that which is acceptable to God, which is well-pleasing in God's sight. So righteousness in men must mean that man is capable of meeting God's demands and God's desiderata. It means that man so deals with himself that he is acceptable in the sight of God. It means that man meets with God's approval. It means that man is acceptable with God because he is now like God himself. That's the meaning of righteousness. And what the apostle here says is this, that he rejoices in the gospel because God's righteousness for men has been revealed. Now here is a tremendous statement. The first thing we note is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is as much concerned about righteousness as the law was. Let's be absolutely clear about that. The gospel of Jesus Christ is as insistent upon man's righteousness in the presence of God as the law of God ever was under the Old Testament dispensation. The gospel doesn't do away with the law. Now, the apostle says that here, but listen to him saying it again in the 31st verse, the last verse of the third chapter. Having given his exposition of this righteousness, he says, do we then make void the law through faith? He says, somebody may say to me, but look here, Paul, you've just been telling us that you are now preaching a righteousness of God without the law, apart from the law. Do, we then make, do you then make void the law? Do you mean the law is useless and is of no value? Are you dismissing the law through faith? God forbid, he says. Yea, we establish the law. So be very careful of not to put the gospel against the law, as if it throws the law out through the window, as it were. Not at all. The gospel establishes the law. Now you see the importance of this. If we are not clear about this, we shall have a wrong idea as to what the gospel of Jesus Christ is about. What is the gospel of Jesus Christ meant to do? What is it supposed to achieve? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ merely to give me forgiveness and to deliver me from hell? 
Is the gospel of Jesus Christ merely designed to make me happy and to take certain problems and troubles and worries out of my life and to give me a certain amount of help with things that tend to get me down? Thank God it does all that. But that isn't the real object of the gospel. That isn't why the, the Lord Jesus Christ came. That isn't the real intent and purpose of the Christian way of salvation. Well, what is it then? Well, here it is. It's stated for us. The ultimate end and objective of the Christian gospel is to answer a question that was propounded by Job at the dawn of history. How shall a man be just with God? That's what it comes to do. The business of the, of the gospel is to make us righteous with God. To make us acceptable with God. To enable us to stand in the presence of God. Now you may have comfortable feelings. You may have had marvelous experiences. You may have had a great change in your life. And a number of things may have gone out of your life. But I say that unless you've got something that enables you to stand before God now and in the day of judgment. You're not only not a Christian. You've never heard the gospel. This is the central purpose of the gospel. To make a man just with God. To enable us to stand with righteousness in the presence of God. Now this can never be emphasized too frequently. It seems to me that one of the great dangers confronting the church and confronting evangelism always is to lose sight of this very thing. And the result is that you not only get a false evangelism, but you get spurious conversions. You get a believism instead of faith. And you get a type of individual regarding himself or herself as Christian who's not really concerned about righteousness. They've taken what they want. They say they're no longer afraid of punishment. They believe they're forgiven. And they've had this and that. But this is the question. Do we know God? Does it bring us into the presence of God? That's the object of the Christian salvation. It is intensely concerned about righteousness. As much so as the law. It doesn't make void the law. It establishes the law. Very well. How does it do this? That's the great question. And that's the thing, of course, about which the apostle is boasting. How can a man be just with God? Before he can be just with God, he must have kept the law. He must have honored it in every respect. He must be free and delivered from the condemnation of the law. And from the punishment that the law threatened. How can that be done? Now this is the whole glory of the gospel. This is why Paul was ready to preach it anywhere at any time to any kind of individual. What is revealed in the gospel, he says, is God's way of solving that problem. And God's way of solving the problem is this, that God himself provides us with the very righteousness that he demands. And that is the gospel. The gospel tells us of a righteousness from God. A righteousness provided by God in and through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it happens, of course, in this way. The Lord Jesus Christ has satisfied the law of God on our behalf, perfectly. And in every sense. He was made of a woman, you remember, made under the law. That's why he was made under the law. And having thus been made under the law, he rendered a perfect obedience to the law. He kept every jot and tittle. He failed in no respect. He fulfilled God's law completely, perfectly, absolutely. Not only that, 
He has dealt with the penalties meted out by the law upon all sin and upon all sinners. He took your guilt and mine upon himself and he bore its punishment. The penalty of the law was meted out upon him, so he has honored the law completely, positively and negatively, actively and passively. There is nothing further the law can demand. He has satisfied it all. And what the gospel announces is this, that God sent him to do that. And God's way of salvation is that he now gives to us who believe in Christ the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. He imputes to us, that's the term, which if you like means this, he puts to our account. He puts to our account the righteousness of Jesus Christ. First of all, he cancels our debts because Christ has paid them, so the book is cancelled and cleared on that side. Then positively, he puts all the perfection and righteousness of Christ to my account. And thus, clothed and robed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, I stand in the presence of God. That's what he means when he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. This righteousness that God has prepared and gives us in and through Christ, that is the whole message of the gospel. Well, now, notice again how the apostle repeats this. He says it here in chapter 1, 17, but again he says it in chapter 3, verse 21. In verse 20 he has said, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law, which means apart from the law, is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Now there it is again. But perhaps the clearest statement of all of this truth is the one that came in our reading at the beginning in that third chapter of Paul's epistle to the Ephesians and in the ninth verse. The apostle says that this is his ambition, that I may be found in him, not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God, from God, by faith. Now there it is, you see, very clearly. Be found in him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is the righteousness which is of the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God. Not the righteousness of God as an attribute, but a righteousness which is of or from God, which is given to us by faith. The righteousness of Christ, which we have by faith. Now it is only as we grasp this doctrine that we really come to see what good news the gospel is. There is God in his eternal justice and righteousness. Here are we in our sin. How can a man be just with God? Who can stand with the burning fire? Eternal light, eternal light, how pure the soul must be that placed within thy searching sight. It shrinks not, but with calm delight can live and look on thee. That's the question. And there is only one answer. There is only one way. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, that's how it should be. Jesus, thy blood and righteousness. My beauty is, my glorious dress. It is only as we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we can stand in the presence of God. And the gospel is the announcement that that is God's way of salvation. That's what's been revealed. This righteousness that God himself gives to us is the way whereby we are made righteous in the presence of God. That's salvation. 
That's the big thing in salvation. That's the heart of salvation. That's the center of salvation. Not your feeling and mine or this and that experience, but this tremendous thing that God himself does and gives to us freely, for nothing, without money and without price. It's not surprising that the apostle says he is not ashamed of this gospel. Very well, there is his seventh reason. But let us go on and consider his eighth reason. The eighth reason he gives is that the gospel shows how this righteousness becomes ours. How does this righteousness actually come to me as an individual? And his answer is that it is from faith to faith. Now you notice the importance of this. Within the space of these two verses, the apostle mentions this idea of faith four times. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. That's the first time. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, second, to faith, third, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, fourth. Obviously, therefore, this is a vitally important concept. What is this faith? What does he mean by faith? Again, I would say that you can't understand the epistle to the Romans unless you're clear about faith as to what exactly it means. And it isn't always as simple as it appears to be because this category of faith has often been misunderstood. And some people understand it in such a way as to deny the very thing that Paul is teaching at this point. What then is faith? Well, again, we must start with our negatives. Faith is not something that exists in all men. It is not some subjective possession of the whole of mankind. Now, it's often represented like that. You must have heard it many times. I've often heard it being put like this. People say this whole question of salvation is quite simple. You see, nobody should, should uh, be stumbled by this idea of faith. Why, they say, your whole life is a life of faith. You'll go home tonight in a bus, and there you're exercising faith at once. Faith in the driver, they say. Faith in other people driving along the road. Or you may be going by train. Well, of course, you're exercising faith as you take your seat in the train. Faith in the driver. Faith in the brakes. They say the whole of life is lived by faith. You eat bread and butter. You've got faith in the baker. You've got faith in the dairymaid. The whole of life is a life lived by faith. But to me, that, that is not only completely and entirely wrong, but is quite ridiculous. That isn't the faith about which the New Testament speaks. Indeed, I don't recognize that as being faith at all. When you go and sit in that train this evening, you are not exercising faith in the engine driver. You are simply putting into, into practice what is called the law of mathematical probability. All right, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Unconsciously, perhaps, you are saying to yourself, well, thousands, millions of people do this every day, and everything's all right. It's the way in which people normally travel, so I'll do it. You either don't think at all. If you do begin to reason, that's the way in which you do reason. The law of mathematical probability. It's one in a million that something will go wrong, or whatever the figure may chance to be. You're acting on some uh, general assumption. That isn't faith. Because faith is always intelligent and faith knows what it's doing. It isn't something unconscious or subconscious. It's a tremendous activity. You remember we've already had it defined as the obedience of faith. No, no. It isn't just acting on assumptions. 
taking it for granted that as everything is generally right, it'll still be right this time, and that I'm not going to be the odd millionth man in whose case it's suddenly going to go wrong with the food or the travel or whatever else it may chance to be. That isn't faith. It doesn't deserve the description. It's unworthy of the designation. When the New Testament talks about faith, it's talking about something special, something new. By grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. All men have not faith, says the scripture. This is something that is only to be found in a Christian. It is the peculiar thing whereby God passes this righteousness of his to the believer. And no one else has faith. It is the peculiar special quality of Christian people. Very well then, that is the first point which we have to make in connection with this statement of from faith to faith. The second one we have to make is this, that a better translation at this point would be this. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed by faith to faith. Or still better, we could put the verse like this. For therein is revealed the righteousness of God by faith to faith. Now wait a minute, let's be clear about this expression, by faith. What does it mean? Well, it doesn't mean that faith is the condition of salvation. It doesn't mean that our faith is the thing that determines our salvation. It doesn't mean that faith is something which is demanded as a condition of our being saved. And secondly, it doesn't mean this. And oh, how often is it put like this at the present time? Faith is not some kind of a lighter demand that God now makes of us. I mean, lighter than the law. How often has it been put like that? People say, you know how privileged we are, how wonderful it is to be living now. Under the old dispensation, God confronted people with the law. He said, if you keep that, it will save you. You've got to keep that or you won't be saved. They were confronted by the law. Ah, they say, but now it isn't that. There's a new dispensation. God doesn't speak about the law any longer. God simply says, will you believe in my son? Will you accept my son or won't you? How much easier it is the, to do that, they say. How much easier it is to believe in Christ than it was to keep the law. So they, they regard faith as a kind of new law which is easier and simpler than the old law. But you see already in considering the word righteousness we've seen that that is utterly impossible. Because that position is based upon the whole idea that the law has been done away with altogether. And that the gospel makes void the law by offering us some easier way of going into heaven. As if God said, well, the other was rather difficult after all. Forget all about it. Will you believe in my son or won't you? If you will, it's all right. And you slip into heaven easily. That isn't the meaning of by faith. Well, what is it then? Well, the apostle, when he uses this word by faith, always means the same thing. It is always the opposite to everything that is legalistic. Not the opposite of the law, but the opposite of everything that is legalistic. Take what Paul says about himself in Philippians 3. He says that he thought that he was, as regards the demands of the law, perfect and righteous. That's being legalistic. A man thinks that he's made himself righteous by his keeping of the law. That's legalistic. Now, faith is the exact opposite of that. Or if you prefer it, look at it like this. Faith is the opposite of everything that is meritorious in men. Faith is the contradiction and the negation of every tendency in men to say that his merit is enough. Faith is just the blank contradiction to all that. 
let me put it in a phrase, it is in the exclusion of worthiness that the worth of true faith is brought out. So that if what you call your faith hasn't pushed right out of your life every sense of worthiness you've ever had, you haven't got faith. But let me put it to you like this. Our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not our righteousness. Our faith does not constitute our righteousness. Faith is simply the instrument by which we receive the righteousness. Or again, to take it like this. Our faith does not justify us. If you begin to speak like that, you see, you turn faith at once into works. You say, ah, oh, I am justified because of my faith. And immediately you've got something to boast of. You said, ah, it was my faith that did it. The other men haven't got faith. I had faith. My faith has saved me. At once you are contradicting Romans 1.17. Our faith does not justify us. It is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that justifies us and nothing else. It is his robe of righteousness. My beauty is and glorious dress, not my faith. Oh, may God preserve us from turning faith into works and of trying to justify ourselves by our faith. We mustn't do that. It's Christ who is my justification. It is his righteousness that puts me right. But it comes to me through faith. Faith is the instrument or the channel through which this righteousness of Christ is given to me and I am rendered capable of accepting it. Here it is again in Romans 3, 21 and 22. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. It's God's righteousness in Christ. It is through faith in Jesus Christ that the righteousness of Christ comes to us. It is by faith we receive it, but our faith is not it. What a vital distinction that is. So that if you're boasting about your faith, you are still in your sins, you're still unrighteous. God forbid that I should glory in anything, even in my faith. Save the Lord Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, by which the world was crucified to me and I unto the world. Very well then we see that faith is merely the instrument or the channel whereby the righteousness comes to us and we are enabled to receive the righteousness. And you notice he says it is from faith to faith, which I've already translated for you like this. By faith to faith. So that what the gospel reveals is the righteousness of God by faith to faith. What the apostle is emphasizing in other words is this, that salvation is according to God's method of righteousness by faith. Not righteousness by trying to keep the law, not righteousness by any human endeavor or activity, even though you call it faith. It's a righteousness of God by faith. And that comes and is revealed to faith in believers. Now there have been many explanations of this from faith to faith. Some have said it means from the faith of the Old Testament to the faith of the New Testament. Some have said it means from weak faith to strong faith. All these things are quite true. Some say it means simply an intensive statement emphasizing that it is by faith alone. They say that there are expressions like from death to death or from life unto life. So here he says from faith to faith, which simply means faith and faith alone. But I prefer to think of it, as I say, in that other way. That what he is saying is that God's righteousness by faith is revealed to our faith. It is only the man who has faith who sees it. 
and accepts it gladly and rejoices in it. Again, I repeat that verse from Ephesians 2. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For we have received not the spirit that is of the world, but the spirit that is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Or listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. There it is. It is only the man who has the gift of faith who sees this righteousness by faith of Jesus Christ. And he accepts it. He submits himself to it. And he rejoices in it and in it alone. And then finally, the apostle goes on to tell us that all this is not really anything new as it is written. The just shall live by faith. Oh, what an important statement. That was the actual phrase that gave Martin Luther liberty. This is how he puts it. You see, that expression, the righteousness of God, was his stumbling block. He calls that the abstract conception of the righteousness of God. And he couldn't get past it. But then he suddenly saw this phrase, the just shall live by faith. Oh, he said, there is such a thing after all then as a just person, a righteous person. There is the abstract righteousness, here is concrete righteousness. He says, what is this? And suddenly he saw it. He saw that this is the whole difference between the law and faith. He'd been trying to work a righteousness according to the law, but there was an absolute stumbling block to that, this righteousness of God. But now he begins to see. How are these people righteous? Ah, it's a righteousness by faith. So that righteousness of God doesn't mean the attribute in God. It's a righteousness that God gives. And he gives to faith. And his whole life was revolutionized. He saw the abstract and the concrete coming together. And this is how he puts it. When I saw the difference that law is one thing and gospel another, I broke through. He broke through the barrier that was holding him back. And as I had formerly hated the expression, the righteousness of God, I now began to regard it as my dearest and most comforting word, so that this expression of Paul's became to me, in very truth, a gate to paradise. What a revolution, what a transformation. From a miserable, wretched, unhappy monk counting his beads and fasting and sweating and praying, and yet being more and more consciousness of failure, to the herald of the Reformation, to the glorious preacher of the gospel, rejoicing in the glorious liberty of the children of God. And it all came to him through understanding Romans 1.17. The abstract righteousness, the concrete righteousness, Ah, yes, he suddenly saw it. Habakkuk had said it. He hadn't seen it fully. Habakkuk was thinking of the problem in his own day. The children of Israel in captivity under the Chaldeans. What's going to happen to them? Are they going to be exterminated? Is this the end? No, no. The just shall live by faith. Or a better translation altogether is this. The righteous by faith or the just by faith shall live. In other words, those who are righteous by faith shall live. Men may put them to death, but they're still right with God, and they'll go on living through all eternity. That's the basic principle. The righteous or the just by faith shall live. They belong to God. 
and nothing shall finally be able to separate them from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not surprising that Paul quotes that not only in Romans 1.17 but in Galatians 3.11 and also the author of the epistle to the Hebrews in Hebrews 10.38. There is no more of a vital statement for us than this. The just by faith shall live. Having been justified by God, we are eternally safe. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.